Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Elisomi Adeshida, the, uh, the Provost of Nazarbayev University and uh, going to introduce the speaker today. Uh, but first, let me welcome you to the Autumn Colloquium Series, which is sponsored by Energetic Cosmos Lab, led by Professor George Smooth, and also the Physics Department at uh, Nazarbayev University. So there'll be a series of talks in this uh, seminar series, and uh, please, you're welcome to join. We'll be publicizing them very actively over the, over the next few months. But today we are very honored and happy to welcome Professor Orfa Lahav, who's going to be the first speaker in the autumn series. And his title is AI, which is Artificial Intelligence on our planet and for exploring the universe. Let me first introduce our honored guest, Professor Orfa Lahav, got his bachelor's degree in physics from Tel Aviv University in Israel. Master's of Science degree in physics also at Ben Gurion University in Israel, and PhD degree in physics from the University of Cambridge. Was a staff member there for many years at the Institute of Astronomy and a fellow of St. Catherine's College. After many years at uh, Cambridge, he moved to uh, UCL, University College London, as the head of astrophysics. Just, uh, just served for many years in that position, and also as vice dean of the faculty of mathematical and physical sciences. Uh, Professor uh, Lahav is the parent chair of astronomy in the astrophysics group at UCL, and presently vice dean international, it means that he's, in, he's responsible for international affairs, international students at UCL. He's also co-director of a center funded, a funded center for doctoral training in data intensive science. So I, my understanding has been at uh, came, uh, UCL for about 17 years from my discussion just briefly, uh, just uh, a few minutes ago. And his work involves heavily machine learning for big data. So today, again, let me give the title of his talk. AI, artificial intelligence on a planet and for exploring the universe. So please help me welcome Professor Offa Lahab. Thank you. The floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Provost, for the very kind introduction. And thanks uh, for, for inviting me to, to speak to you. It's, it's a great honor. And I uh, understand it's quite an interesting broad audience. Uh, I suggest that uh, you know if you have questions throughout the talk, please put it in the Q and A uh, place, and uh, later on uh, those questions will be moderated. Um, so the topic is really trying to connect two disciplines, which are quite distinct, but they have more in common with each other. One is the exploration of the whole universe, and the other one is uh, artificial intelligence, which is a, a growing field. And I'll do my best in this talk to connect the two. In case you wonder what's this picture uh, there, it, this is a, a picture of the sky where the, uh, where the, I hope you can see the arrow, where this is actually the Milky Way as seen by Gaia, also with the large and small Magellanic clouds. And this map is a map of dark matter. Uh, as informed from a survey called Dark Energy Survey. Now, you may puzzle how come I can show you dark matter if it's dark, but I'll come to it later. Um, now, uh, I just like to thank straight at the beginning, right at the end, many collaborators and postdocs and PhD students over the years. In this picture, you can see some of my students and former students at a nice occasion we had when pre-COVID, um, where we can all be on the same roof. And uh, some of the work I'm going to show uh, was done with them or led by them. 
And on the left is a picture of our campus. Uh, I was taking this picture actually a week ago, today as I walked there, uh, it's full of students. So this is very special for us that uh, there is some kind of, um, you know, we're near normality. Hopefully we had a nice meeting with students earlier today. And after this talk, I have to go for an induction of uh, students. So these are kind of happy times relative to the past year and a half. Um, now, the outline of this talk as the title implies, I'd like to first say a bit about AI. I know it's very common knowledge now, but to give some perspective on that in terms of how what's happening in it on our planet, but then to move to the subject of galaxy surveys to talk about the status of the cold dark matter plus cosmological constant model for the non-cosmologist, I'll explain what this is. And then to show how AI can help us, but also I'll take a critical view of what can go wrong uh, with AI and what are the challenges. And I would like to also emphasize that we have to think in a new way about training the next generation of astronomers in data science. And I'll give an example of a program that we have here at UCL. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I hope that sound is, is fine and you can see the, the slide. So what is AI? It's probably more, I mean, like in any subject, who was the first, it's difficult to tell, but there was certainly pioneering work by, by Alan Turing. Uh, and then uh, as far as I know, the, the name AI, artificial intelligence was coined by John McCarthy in, in about 1956. So the, the concept is quite old actually. Uh, you can think of it as a branch of, of computer science um, on how to build smart machines. And there are many buzzwords around AI, big data, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and so on, which maybe one can think of them as a subset of AI. These are all definitions, so you have to look more carefully what people are actually doing with it. Um, there are lots of examples in everyday life, right? Image and voice recognition. We're all familiar with virtual agents that you call a company, and instead of having a human there, someone, you know, there's an, a synthetic voice talking to you who sometimes understands what you're saying, sometimes not. So you can also see. AI can get it wrong, but obviously this will be a very um, important field in the future. A driverless car so is another example where AI is absolutely cr critical in terms of analyzing the data from the sensors and making decisions if the car is to turn to the left or to the right, including some ethical questions. Uh, and then of course, games, it's quite known that, that AI, AI algorithms manage to, to uh, to win a chess game and a go game. And in the plot below, I show some other examples, including of course, smartphone that everyone has, uh, includes a lot of AI ideas uh, and uh, all the way to smart home uh, that will basically algorithms that will run, run our homes and, and monitor the energy and so on. So one can go on and on with examples, it's just everywhere. Uh, Usually we say, oh, we need AI because there's lots of data, but I would like to say, and usually we praise the human brain. We say we cannot, you know, the brain is so special. It is very special. But what you see here, and I hope you can see it first, I have to tell you, it's not an animation. It's a static picture. It's a static picture. And there are actually 12 black dots, but I have not men, met anyone who could see all 12 simultaneously, okay? It's a limitation of the brain to see all 12 points simultaneously. If anyone on the line can see all 12 points, you know, put a comment in the Q&A <laughs> uh, that, that you managed to see 12. So I would like to say that as much as we value the brain, uh, in certain situations, it's also limited and it, it's good to have the assistance, and I emphasize the word assistance, of a computer, for example, in detecting those 12 points. So, you know, also we would like to do multitasking, right? It's very nice to write a paper at the same time, 
to write some notes and so on. Maybe AI could act as a kind of an assistant, a personal assistant and improve things, but it could also make mistakes and it could make uh, embarrassing mistakes. So quite a lot of, of this topic is about uh, also uh, you know, reliability. M my own take on this, I say it from the beginning and you'll see it later through examples, is that really uh, we need to connect this triangle. There are actually laws of physics which have been known for a long, long time. If you know Newton's laws and then Einstein's equations, uh, laws of physics, you know, probably they are there even without humans. It depends on your philosophical point of view. But, you know, there are laws of physics that run the universe, so to speak. There's the human knowledge of some of those laws. Maybe we haven't learned everything yet. And I would like to think of AI as something that would help us to connect laws of physics with data and human knowledge. And I actually like this other AI, which is called augmented intelligence, that we actually help the human to digest lots of information, but we also use knowledge from the human. So this is one definition uh, that the augmented intelligence is a way of enhancing human intelligence rather than replacing it. And it reinforces the role of human intelligence play when using machine learning and deep learning algorithm to discover relationships and solve problems. Some colleagues have a view of that, you know, everything can be done by a robot completely, by AI, and some people hate AI. So my take is sort of in between of using AI to help us. And now moving to the cosmology, uh, of course, uh, you know, having George Smoot on the line, uh, I mean, there's not much to add. I mean, you, you, you probably heard him talking about uh, the cosmic micro background, uh, just an amazing phenomenon if you just think about it, that we see echoes of the Big Bang from what, 13.8, a billion years ago, and then universe expanding, but gravity by its nature brings have the epoch of renovation, and then we have the formation of, of, of galaxies and, and within them stars and planets. And it's really quite remarkable how much we know. And in terms of data, astronomy was always there at the frontier. You know, we were not shocked by the amount of data. And we know that in these projects, we really go from one level to another, lots and lots of data. So when I did my PhD in Cambridge, as mentioned earlier, I used, a, very proudly, I used a catalog which had several thousands of galaxies or at best tens of thousands. And then I worked on a project to the two degree field, an Anglo-Australian project we had, which mapped a quarter of a million galaxies and now in the dark energy survey in which I've been involved uh, uh, over many years, we have 300 million galaxies and the next generation of, uh, of, of projects such as uh, Rubin LSST, the Euclid satellite, WFIRST and so on, they'll map billions of galaxies. Okay, so really moving into this amazing era uh, I mentioned here Planck and Gaia and Lofar and SKA and so on and so forth. I apologize, they're full of acronyms. Euclid is a real name of a real person, but the rest are all acronyms. I apologize for, on Gaia, sorry. Gaia and Planck, sorry. Planck is also a name and Gaia is certainly a concept. Uh, uh, but apologies for non-astronomers, but just to give you an idea, a lot is going on. So what is our understanding of the universe right now? At present, I emphasize at present, Universe is made of only four or five percent is of ordinary matter. It's quite shocking. We belong to a minority of five percent. Uh, around 25, 26 percent is so called cold dark matter, which we don't quite know what it is, but we have to put it there to explain the data. And strangely, we have this something which is nearly 70 percent dark energy, which again, we don't know what it is, but it is a variation of or an extension of a concept by Einstein called the cosmological constant. That's his paper from 1917 in German, but you can find a translation uh, uh, online in the website of Princeton University, translation to English. And, and this is just an artist's impression that due to this dark energy, probably the universe is accelerating at present. 
Um, just, I know there are people from different backgrounds in this audience, but for the physicists, I'd just like to mention Einstein's equation. And this is this lambda, this term that describes a, a cosmological constant and maybe more generally dark energy. And in this equation, it appears on the left as part of the curvature term. And on the right hand side are the is, is, are the different energies and masses that generate that change to curvature. So in general relativity, space time gets curved by the amount of matter and energy. But in a more simple way, almost everyone has seen that acceleration is minus gm over r squared. This was by Newton. A little known fact is that Newton also talked about a linear force. And if you put a constant lambda over three, it just behaves like cosmological constant. So it's little known, we actually wrote a little article about it, Lucy Calder and myself. Uh, and actually Newton in Principia in 1687 talked about these two forces for reasons I don't have time to explain. Uh, and so it's quite interesting that he talked about it. He didn't call the constant lambda though. And, but la and later Einstein put it there because he wanted the static universe. But as you know, when he noticed the expansion of the universe, he thought that this was the blunder of his life to put this lambda and he recommended uh, uh, putting it as zero. And uh, he said, you know, I'm a detective in a search of, and his friend Eddington said that he is a detective in a search for criminal, it's much called constant. So it's interesting, when I was a student, lambda was believed to be zero. Now it's recognized as being there that it's recognized as acceleration of the universe. It was another Nobel prize in cosmology given to those who discovered that through supernovae. Now, we don't see lambda written on the sky. We have to work hard to do it. There are different probes, such as the cosmic micro background that uh, George, Smoot, and colleagues have uh, studied so beautifully. But there are other techniques, such as standard candles. So we can use these supernovae, exploding stars, actually binary stars, that generate a particular flash of light. And they're like standard candles. So we know that if they're, further, if, if they're seen as being faint, that means they're far away. We can tell the curvature of the universe. Similarly, we can use standard rulers by looking at structures of the large case structure. There's a particular feature called baryonic acoustic oscillation, which was discovered by the Sloan and 2DF surveys. Here is, by the way, Mr. Euclid, or maybe Professor Euclid, I should say, uh, where the, you know, that space mission is named in his honor. Classes of galaxies can also help us to weigh what's going on. And in fact, these funny features there, they're not real. They're optical illusions due to what's called gravitational lensing. What happens is if you look at this diagram here, a particular galaxy may have a particular shape, but the light gets bended according to general relativity. So what is maybe this type of ellipse becomes much narrower in this example. And you see it here in full glory. It's called strong lensing. There's also weak lensing. And this has been very much used by all these techniques. A lot of the activity is by searching for this parameter W, which is an equation of state for those of you who take uh, physics courses, it's pressure to density with the speed of life squared. And you can show that the density will be able like the scale factor to that power. Matter itself, W is known to be zero. So if we go from, uh, we go into earlier times, the universe was dense. As, as we go towards the present, this is the red shift, the amount of expansion, the measurement of the shift in the lines. So high red shift means earlier times. Uh, the universe gets more and more diluted by a to the minus three. But if w is minus one, which is very strange, it's a negative number, you do my one minus one, you get a cons zero here. So you have just a constant and that's acceleration. And the universe starts accelerating about 6 billion years ago, and it became dark energy dominated about three and a half years ago, two and a half billion years ago. And these supernova data really help us to tell what's going to happen. So when I was a student, we were all told that the universe is the critical density. This is now going to be wrong, this green line. And now we know it's accelerating due to the supernovae. Um, this is results from a survey in which I've been involved, dark energy survey using more supernovae. And this W, we said, if it's minus one, it's cosmological constant, it's very close to that. And omega matter, as I mentioned before, it's about 
30% because the 5% ordinary matter plus 25% cold dark matter. Uh, and as you can see, this is so fascinating that it stimulated lots and lots of activities around the world. So this is the dark energy survey, which is on a telescope in Chile, which I've been involved for many years since I moved to UCL, in fact, in 2004. And DESI, and by the way, for both DESI and DESI, the lenses were assembled uh, in our basement here at University College London. DESI uh, is on a, on, a, on a mountain in uh, Arizona. DESI stands for Dark Energy Survey, and DESI stands for Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. And I alluded to the next generation, which are being built on another hill in Chile, uh, what's called now the Vera Rubin Observatory, LSST, uh, Euclid satellite, and there are many more, many more projects. Now, why, why, what's the connection to AI? I think this is kind of quite easy to imagine because I mentioned dark energy survey, we have maybe, we already have in the bag 300 million galaxies, but when we move to Rubin, Euclid SKA, square kilometer array, which is a big radio, facility, we're talking about billions of galaxies and the cost is about a billion dollars. So I like to tell the funding agencies that it's a very good deal because if you pay a billion dollar to map a billion galaxies, it's only one dollar per galaxy. So it's a very good deal. Uh, and you can see also the number of scientists goes up and we have to think also about the human activity, how you communicate uh, with so many uh, uh, Astronomer. So I was very lucky to be to be involved in the leadership of that project. I was the coach of the science committee for many years. We use all these techniques I mentioned before of clusters and weak lensing and Arctic structure and supernovae. And these are the number of objects I mentioned, 3 million galaxies already collected, 2,500 supernovae or so, foreign scientists from seven nations. All observations already completed, but analysis has only been done on the first 50% of the data, why? Because of complexity. So it's, these days, this is the connection to AI. It's not just collecting the data, but what do you do with the data? Luckily, we have many early people who think on the data and are really heroes of the collaboration now uh, in terms of analyzing the data. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the sociology of a subject, uh, I would like to say that uh, we, we edited a book uh, called the Dark Energy Survey, the story of a cosmological experiment, uh, which tells the story in the words of the people who actually created the survey. So there are uh, you know, 88 co-authors who tell the story, how it was done, but we've also added people like artists and a philosopher and anthropologist who tell us about the, their perspective on this. And uh, the publishers just have just informed me that it, it's going to appear very soon also in paperback. So if you're interested not only on the science, but also on how science works, uh, 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 you're welcome to, to look at this book. These are results that appeared in May, got some publicity. I won't go through all the details. These are complicated diagrams of clumpiness of amplitude uh, and clumpiness amplitude against matter density. And this is this W I mentioned before. And But bottom line, when you add surveys, and the CMB data, cosmic micro background data, it is about W of minus one plus minus 0, 0.03. So you know, if you like to take one message home is, is that the data at present subject to all kinds of uncertainties are constant, consistent just with W of minus one, which is Einstein's cosmological constant. So Einstein was, wrong, was right once more. Uh, we also use, this is actually work led by a former PhD student of mine, Niall Jeffrey, we use the data to create that picture, which was on my first slide. So this is a picture of dark matter. Now, by now you should know how we got it done because I showed you the effect of gravitational lensing. So we use the distortion of the images to tell us what's between us and the real images. Now we don't know what the real images are, but because the, the distortion is correlated, among neighboring points, we can work it out. So these are clever techniques which use AI. And here we use 100 million galaxies with shape measurements. And uh, you know, the public liked it and we got some publicity on BBC 
online and on television as well uh, back in May. So what you see here is clumps of dark matter. Of course, it's color coding. So when you see that it's very yellow, that means it's a very dense region. Well, this region is more like a void. Okay, so we can really see the clumpiness. Although the universe started almost uniform, as we can see from the cosmic micro background fluctuations were really, really tiny. One part in 100,000, as time goes on, gravity is very non-democratic and dense regions become denser, empty regions become emptier. And we see it here. Uh, I mentioned DESI. Uh, so this is a project uh, led by Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, DESI, I should say, is led by, by Fermilab. Uh, and both gets a lot of support from uh, the Department of Energy and other funding agencies uh, around the world, including our own STFC in, in the UK, the both, both project. And, and this is actually uh, mainly to look at these features I showed you standard rulers that are called baryonic crystal oscillations. We don't have to explain what they are exactly, but they're features which also which are very similar to the features that appear in the cosmic micro background. And uh, it's a standard ruler. The idea here is to measure spectroscopically 35 million galaxies using this technique of 5,000 fibers. So you can put the fibers point at the sky and simultaneously get 5,000 spectra. Uh, now, everything is wonderful, but uh, when you start looking at details, you realize, although we have this model that maybe 99 out of 100 cosmologists would say this is the right model with the baryons and cold dark matter and cosmological constant, there, is, there are some inconsistencies. Okay, now history of science is full of examples where some inconsistencies just went away. It's just that the data were too noisy, for example. And the, the tension went away, but there are also other examples where, in fact, tension led to a revolution. It led to a paradigm shift. And I was very lucky uh, when I was a student to see that paradigm shift towards, it was actually just after I finished doing my PhD, uh, that what was believed to be a universe without a cosmological constant became a universe with a cosmological constant, okay? It was because of tension. Now, the biggest tension we have is in the Hubble constant, which is the rate of expansion of the universe. And it has this funny unit, kilometer per second to megaparsec. If you work it out, it's units of one over time. And those who use the cosmic micro background claim it's about 67. And those who look, who use uh, special stars called Cepheids claim it's 73. And some of you may think, what's the big deal? 67 or 73, apparently it makes a big difference to our cosmological model. I should say again, years ago, there was a competition between two astronomers. One claimed it was 50, the other one claimed it's about 100. So now it's much narrower, but still there's this discussion. And the question is, are these systematics or maybe, uh, maybe this is actually um, new physics hidden? We just don't know. Okay, so, at this point, yes, and there is a whole discussion about it as to uh, what is the, uh, which methods to trust and so on and so forth. And we just published um, earlier this month, a paper on the archive um, with a, a, a former student, a former postdoc, which we call the Bars Guide to the Abu Constant. It's quite long, but it goes through all the methods and I think could be useful for people entering the field. And we have this traffic light where, where we don't mean that green means everything is correct and red is wrong. Red means more work is needed. And also uh, we just put another paper with Joel Silk uh, on the question when to stop. When do you decide you already have the, num the answer and you want to move on to a new question? So we put it in nature astronomy. You are welcome to look at it. It's more philosophical. So it's quite interesting, you know, when do we decide that we, we know already which universe we're at? Um, okay, so now at this point, I'm turning into the AI part of this. And you, I've convinced you by now that with billions of galaxies and so on, we do need tools. The question is, if AI is just a black box. Can we explain or interpret it? Uh, how do we minimize biases due to incomplete training sets? Do we tell the machine, the robot, about the physics we already know? Do we tell them about Newton's law? And 
uh, can we also learn new physics from it? So I think these are deep questions. I don't know, I don't have the answers uh, to all of them. Uh, it's easier to ask the questions, but I think we'll see these questions coming over and over again in coming years. What has really changed is now there's lots and lots of free software. This is a package called scikit-learn. There's also one called TensorFlow. So it's much easier. You can really, as a student, you can just go to the network and download those packages. Of course, you should not use them as black box. You try to understand them, but it's quite easy to start getting results almost straight away. And the, some of you might have already used it, uh, but uh, those of or not, this is very, I'm giving just an example. One algorithm, which is more intuitive, is called decision tree. So we're all used to decisions in life. This is an example of someone trying to decide based on a salary on whether or not to take a job. Uh, so here is an offer which looks to me quite generous, but if it's not high enough, it's a no, you decline. If it's yes, you check how far away it is from your home and if they give you a taxi. So this is a decision. Now you can imagine an algorithm that does something similar, that if something is above a certain number, let's say the size of a galaxy decides it's a particular type of galaxy. Okay, so you can see the connection. You can also combine many, many trees and you can get a forest. And for example, if one tree tells you that it's class A, for example, that it's a star, and the other tree also tells you it's a star, but this tree tells you, no, 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 it's a galaxy. You can average them or look at the distribution and decide what's the final uh, uh, decision. Okay, what's the final? So that's an example how, how algorithms like this work. So, you know, it's after all just an algorithm. It's a set of code, lines in a code, but what you put there is critical and also you have to understand what you do and for example, a decision tree to ask the right questions. Uh, so then a lot is going on in, in, in astronomy, of course. Uh, the simple example is classification. You can tell if it's a star or galaxy or what's a galaxy type, if it's a supernova or a gravitational wave. And supernova. So you can teach the computer what is the correct answer based on, on an example. Let's say that the human studied what are star, what are galaxies. So you train on a thousand cases which were, uh, which, which a human uh, produced or could be several people. And then you let the computer apply to millions and billions. Okay, this is called supervised. The other methods which are unsupervised. There's also a new thing called deep learning, which I'll come to in a minute. And it's so successful. We don't quite know why it is so successful. There's regression going from Photo Z to a photometric redshift, which I'll say a few words about, and planets of properties of planets and galaxies. Uh, you can work out cosmological parameters like those I described. And you can also use machine learning to enhance simulations. So lots of ideas. I should say that I was fortunate to get into this game again last century. Uh, this was in the early 90s. I got interested in it. It was quite on the fringes, I would say, although I have some colleagues in particle physics who also played with it, but it was quite fringes. You had to work quite hard to explain to astronomers why to use uh, neural networks. At that time, we, we basically showed 800 or so galaxy images to six experts in galaxy classification, and we showed that the neural net can reproduce it. Uh, and then we use it also on a survey called Galaxy Zoo. That's when the whole public was invited to classify galaxies. And again, we show that at the level of about nine, over 90%, uh, machine can do the same thing as human. And we applied it to supernova. That's another paper. And you can see lots of acronyms, uh, naive Bayes, K nearest neighbors, support vector machine, artificial neural network, boosted decision trees and so on and so forth. And we use that to classify supernovae. Again, this was done actually on simulations, but very good success rate. And this kind of work will be used in the Ruby analysis team. I mentioned photometric redshifts. The, the idea is that 
when you cannot measure spectroscopy, this is a detailed spectrum of an object flux against wavelength. But if you can only measure a few colors of the galaxy, you can still learn something by the redshift. So you can put in those four or five numbers and get the redshift. And we did, we created a neural net method back in 2004 and another one 2016. And the very latest, a student of mine, uh, ben Hendricks just submitted his thesis and he actually presented the network for the whole image without extracting in advance uh, just five numbers. So the whole image is there and it seems to do better. The, the paper is on the archive if anyone is interested. And another student, uh, Sunil, together with former student Antonella and former postdoc Will, uh, we, we show that you can get not only the photometric region but also the properties of the galaxies such as the stellar content. It's a bit technical, but I hope you get the idea that you can show five numbers and actually get that information. Now, uh, I, I'm conscious of the time. I would like to finish in a few minutes, but I cannot this, give this talk before talking about deep learning, because this was kind of what happened with artificial neural networks. I told you that, you know, it was coined in 1956, the name artificial intelligence, and then there was some activity in the 80s and 90s, including some of us in astronomy. And then it kind of went quiet. People said, we don't quite know what it does, et cetera, et cetera. It's not quite accurate. But then, uh, what, about six, seven years ago, people came up with this idea of deep learning. The, the idea is this, if I have an object here, in, in the standard way, I have an object and I do, I extract features of that object. I extract these two circles here, for example, and maybe I extract these features there. So say I have 10 features, I feed it in, and I tell whether it's a car or not a car. In deep learning, you show the whole picture of, of, of you don't say anything. You just show the whole picture and uh, it, it looks, text, looks at everything. Now, part of it is irrelevant. It is a tree standing near the car. It's not so relevant, but never mind. The, the algorithm hopefully will be clever enough to figure it out. So this is an example. What the, the trick with learning is that you put different masks on it or filters. And what you use is, is the convolution or the, the way the picture is seen through that filter, right? If I put that filter there, I'll see only that part. Or if I put it there, I'll see a different part and so on and so forth. And that's what you feed in. And then you can tell, is this a bird or sunset or dog or cat? So this seems to be, so it's done wonderful things. Uh, computer scientists are working very hard to try to understand why it's doing so well. But this is kind of the state of the art. This is an example with the Rubin LSST, only simulations that I talk about gravitational lensing. This is a way of, uh, of actually trying to learn about those features um, of arcs. And in fact, there's a compar comparison study that showed that uh, the neural network, especially deep learning, could do much, much better than humans in getting, in, in, in telling which is which. So uh, it's very impressive. And I think we'll see more of that because it's just impractical to ask a student, however talented, to look at 20 billion images. I mentioned the weak lensing dark matter. So I showed you roughly how you do it and you get regions which are dark, but there's dark matter because galaxies' shapes got distorted. And uh, this is yet another deep mass method, uh, uh, again, produced by former student, Je uh, Nile Jeffrey. We call it deep mass. So essentially, we show the algorithm lots and lots of simulations. So they know how to relate the distortion of images to the projected mass. And that's what you get there compared with some other traditional techniques such as Wiener filter, Kaiser squires and so on. And you can do even more. You can show many, many pictures of the sky in simulations to the network and then show the one universe and then tell what are the properties of the universe. For example, what is the amount of matter? And it can do better than just traditional techniques. So I hope you get the idea. You just bombard this poor, poor algorithm with lots and lots of simulations, and you try to get out uh, those uh, parameters. So I think the future is very bright there, but 
it would also be important to understand it. Now, um, I'm really, really there. Uh, just two more minutes. I would like to say something about education. So, you know, the, the world is developing very fast. I don't have to tell you that. And, you know, I, the way, if I look back the way I was educated to write computer codes, it was really, you know, in the Stone Age. And now the young generation who is going to lead the world uh, needs new tools. So what we've created here at University College London is with the support of our research council, uh, STFC, we created a school or we call it a doctoral training center in data intensive science. And this, the PG students spend four years here at UCL, but Within that four years, they also do some projects with the industry and they actually go and spend time at the industry, okay? So you can see some of the companies we have here. We have things like the Met Office, the London Underground, um, ASOS, which is a fashion retail company, uh, UK Atomic Energy Authority, and so on, right? And for example, my these are my four current students, uh, 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 Constantina and Sunil, they just finished working for six months in a company, in that company, ASI, which is now got a different name, faculty. Uh, ben or did six months in ASOS and Sunil has not, he will go there next year probably, but at the same time, they're doing projects in astronomy. So Constantina is working on a gravitational wave follow-up, uh, ben and, and Sunil are working for automatic redshifts. So we have four, four cohorts. Ben just submitted his thesis. We, we, we have 45 students and actually today, the new cohort, the fifth cohort is starting. And in fact, after this talk, I'm going to their induction to welcome them. We have seven new students in this program. So, you know, I'll be happy to, to discuss it. We also run, by the way, a spin-off uh, activity in Jordan at the University of Amman. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we cannot travel, but we got a special grant and we give them online courses there. So I think really data intensive science AI, except for first, it's very universal interdisciplinary. And uh, it's also a great way to, you know, to internationally different universities. Uh, this is the activity with Jordan that I mentioned uh, that, uh, and, and we've given that course and we have 46 students, by the way, 62% female. Uh, so and this was the launch event. So we're quite excited about all these activities. And this is my very last slide, just some thoughts and also a bit of criticism. Okay, so it's not just, I hope you're not going away from this talk saying AI is just wonderful. It's perfect. It's not perfect at all. We have to worry about what it gives us, but it is some kind of, industrial revolution, if you like, in cosmology and many other fields, uh, in both the special domain and time domain, but there are many challenges. Uh, when you train, you want to make sure that the training set is representative. You know, you, you cannot, you know, if you want to talk about dogs and cats, it's unfair if you show only training set when you have 10 cats and 90 dogs. Uh, okay, so you have to do something about to balance your training set. There is the question, do you tell some physics in advance? And what type of physics? Maybe it's the wrong physics. Uh, there is the question about understanding uh, and explaining and interpreting algorithms, especially for deep learning, which is still a bit of a mystery why it's doing so well. Uh, the question is, how do you actually go up with your algorithms? I mean, it could be that it worked on a thousand objects, but will it work on a million? Will it work on a billion? Maybe the computing time will be just so long. So you have to do some clever tricks. And again, some of our, our students are looking into benchmarking. But in any case, it's a great training. And I'm quite impressed by our students who go to this program. They, they, get, they know so much at the end of it because they know about the astronomy and particle physics. I should say some of them do particle physics as the core PhD, but they also go to the industry and they come back to us and teach us new ideas from the industry. And maybe they give the industry some ideas from the university. So I think it's a very interesting 
a cross fertilization there. Of course, one can be philosophical and ask, are we going to learn new things from AI? Well, partially it depends on nature. So, you know, I still hope to see an example where a neural net uh, or decision tree machine learning algorithm will actually, you know, tell us entirely new physics. So, you know, let's wait and see. So thanks very much for listening and uh, I would welcome question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ofer, for this fascinating talk. So now we move to Q&A session and we have a few minutes. So let me first remind the participants that you can ask uh, your questions through the Q&A button and I will read those questions to Professor Ofer. So, so far we already have a few questions. Uh, so one of the questions is a, is a very deep question and uh, Janat is asking, is it possible that the fundamental laws of physics or the fundamental laws of nature are themselves neural networks, some sort of neural networks, instead of simple mathematical expressions like Einstein's theory of relativity or other theories? What is your opinion on that? Well, it's a, it's a thought-provoking question. It's a very interesting one. It, well, you have to start uh, asking, you know, whether mathematics is the language of nature or is it only a human way of explaining nature? I don't know the answer to that. It's a very deep question as well. Uh, you know, does matter know, does the universe know about equations or is it just some kind of language? So it would be in a similar uh, connection. And in fact, I was actually on the phone earlier this week with a very interesting discussion with a researcher in DeepMind. And he's done some work also with, uh, with some of our people on, on trying to see if you present data, could the neural network come up with the equation uh, of that? But yeah, maybe, maybe we would, we, for certain purposes, we, we might just have to live with the neural network as the equation or, or turn it into some uh, symbolic uh, uh, language. But I'll, I'll keep thinking about your question. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think Professor Smoot has a comment, right? Turn myself back on for a second. So I, I couldn't resist. Uh, I was thinking of a different thing and I'll get back to that. And that because I, I guess of my age or whatever it is, I uh, not only remember the quote from Galileo, even in the original Italian, about how the, the language of nature is mathematics, but in fact, the history of progress in science up until extremely recently has been the use of mathematics and the beauty of the mathematics, even the aesthetics of the mathematics, maybe more so than it should be, that we have seen for the last 50 years, symmetries of nature and symmetries of the mathematics being the things that turn out to uh, give us the right answer, including general relativity as a classic case where general relativity with its curvature tensor and with the cosmological constant are the maximally symmetric situation in terms of the equations. And so it is, uh, it is difficult for me to, uh, to hope that there is some other kind of chaos to it where it's underneath uh, you know, some kind of a neural net that's figuring out everything. Although you can certainly argue that the behavior of the universe is very much like a large computing machine. But I, I wanted to say one other comment. So I'm, I'm abusing my privilege here. And that is when you heard these presentations, it wasn't clear where the science came in. It was there, you know, Professor Lahav really did say, but it is, a, it is good to think about it because when I first tried to do these kind of problems, I wanted to put the physics in because I love the mathematics, the beauty of it and the continuity. I don't believe that the universe has an arc and a gap and a new arc, <laughs> but somehow I believe it's continuously, you know, there's a continuous track through space time. It may be a lot of discrete steps, but there's continuous motion through that, that kind of behavior, even the evolution of, if you treat it as wave functions. And, so I thought it was very important to put the science in and I tried setting up, you know, we had less data in a certain sense. So you had to actually put in some additional information and, you know, trying to put in, it's actually very difficult to put the science into the AI. It is, a, uh, and in fact, 
there are so many problems that AI is, is solving that are so complicated and so uh, difficult that like, you know, consumer preferences or things, you know, the things that or the or, or parts of the weather where there's a lot of chaos in the system or a lot of butterfly effect that the the these sort of tensor, tensor flow and other algorithms work very well if you have a very large amount of data with known outcomes and they look for the structure between them. So what what uh, Professor Lahav is doing is he's using a very large number of simulations. And as long as those simulations are accurately done, they put the science in because they tell the AI what the output should look like in various cases. And so the science is being put in, but at a backwards way, as the science been put at the end, here's the output of what the science does. How does the output of what you see look like? Now it's more complicated to do that when you have many steps along the way, but in fact, you can do simulations that stop at various places and do it away. So the science is in there, but it's in there in a difficult, in an in a end product kind of way. So that the discovery of new science becomes difficult for the AI, because if you didn't put some examples in of this new science, it's not gonna be able to find it very well. So now Professor Lahav has to defend himself or, <laughs> or agree or whatever. Well, well, well thank, thanks very much uh, for these remarks. I mean, I, I tend to agree with most of them. I think this combination, I would look, I think it's a two-way process. It's one is a combination of what physics to put in, and it depends on your prior. If you think there's a Bayesian, which things you trust, you know, Newton's laws or Einstein's laws, and, and uh, which laws you don't quite trust. So it seems to me one way is to put things in, but we would also like the neural net to discover perhaps discrepan discrepancies. And maybe those discrepancies will be, be kind of a flag that's saying, look, some physics is missing here. So I, I'm kind of optimistic, I, but it has to be handled with care. Okay, and also to, not to be circular that what you put in is what you get out. But it seems to me it's a two-way process and it's gonna be a very, very interesting uh, area actually. Right. And you just can't do it quite arbitrarily because we're depending upon space-time having certain well-behaved, you know, well-behaved situations in order to be able to do the simulations, in order to be able to make constantly your models. You can put addition, you can put another force in, you know, just like dark energy, you could put another energy or force into the system. You could make some particles decay, you could do things like that. You can't just arbitrarily change things. Uh, you don't get to have Thanos snap his fingers. It's, you know, you, 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 you're looking for a certain amount of continuity and a certain amount of regularized behavior in the system. And you need that uh, in order to understand, um, you know, how the cosmology would actually work. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Thanks, thanks Thank for raising They're the, the very, very important, yeah. Thank you very much for this interesting discussion. So uh, I think we are running out of time, unfortunately. We have lots of questions, but uh, um, we don't have much time. So Professor Smoot, would you like to say uh, some concluding words? Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Lahav for this interesting talk. And also for the 50 some people, 55 people or whatever that showed up for this talk. That's great. I noticed that fewer people from America just because it's the middle of the night showed up, but I, I see people from Asia, I see people from Central Asia, I see people from Europe on here. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this talk as much as I did and realize that we're very fortunate to have such a famous person involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also on behalf of a new community, we'd like to thank Professor Leha for this amazing, interesting talk and for Professor Smoot for these interesting remarks. Thank you very Thank much, you. and I hope I hope we'll meet each other in person in the near future, in Kazakhstan or London or other places. Well, I hope things will get back to more normal, but I think things have changed. I think the world has changed, and yeah. AI is one of the things is is one of the most huge changes that is going to go on for the next decade, and uh, I'm really impressed, and you're right at the forefront.